Good morning. morning. Welcome to Earl Street Baptist Church on this brisk November morning, our first first Sunday of winter, if you will. Uh, We are so glad that you are here to worship with us this morning. If you're a guest with us today, we invite you to look in front of you in the pew pocket. There are guest cards that are located there, and we would encourage you to take one of those guest cards out to fill it out and then drop it in the offering plate when it's passed later on in the service. We are just so glad that you've chosen to come and worship with us here this morning. We want to remind you that this Wednesday evening we'll be having our annual church-wide Thanksgiving service. It will be during our regular prayer meeting time, which is at 6.30. We'll be up here for that service instead of downstairs in the fellowship hall. We'll be having our regular fellowship meal, and if you plan to eat with us Wednesday night and you don't normally eat with us, make sure you call the church office tomorrow by 10 o'clock so we can get your name on that list. We would love to have you eat dinner with us. And then join us for our Thanksgiving service again this Wednesday night at 6.30 here in the sanctuary. Then this Thursday evening, our serendipity ladies group will be meeting at 6 o'clock in the fellowship hall. They're going to have a representative from a local ministry called Christmas Shoes who will be here to talk about that organization. There will be a light supper served, and all the ladies of the church are invited to join. That's this Thursday evening at 6 o'clock in the fellowship hall. And then next Sunday morning, during both uh, morning Sunday school hours at 9.15 and at 10.30, we're going to be having our international missions emphasis. And this year, or this time, Margo Love is going to be leading our sessions, and we're going to be focusing on praying for refugees around the world. Again, that will be next Sunday during the 9.15 and the 10.30 Sunday school hour. It will be downstairs in the fellowship hall, and we would love to have you plan to join us during one of those hours next Sunday morning to learn more about how you can pray for refugees around the world. And if you're interested in going on the Ecuador mission trip next summer, there's going to be an informational meeting about that this morning. It will be immediately following the second worship service. It'll be down in the Family Life Center. It'll be a brief meeting, but it's an opportunity for you to learn more about the trip that's going to be taking place so you can decide if this is a right trip for you and you can begin to make plans for that. On Sunday, December the 2nd, we'll be having our annual Hanging of the Green service. That's the service where we decorate our sanctuary and get this home of ours ready for the Christmas season. It's a service that we invite you to participate in in helping us hang the decorations, but we need to know if you plan to participate so Janice can make appropriate preparations. There are sign-up sheets located on all three floors. If you can join or participate in that, make sure you get your name on that list. Or if you don't get on the sign-up sheet, make sure you let Janice know so she can make uh, appropriate plans. And lastly, our annual missions marketplace took place yesterday. We had a great day. There are still some items available for sale downstairs in the fellowship hall. We encourage you to stop by there either in between the worship hours or afterwards. Browse through the items that are left and make a purchase there to help support international missions. All the proceeds from the missions marketplace go to support the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Now as we get ready to move into our time of worship, I want to recognize Ted Brigman to come and call our church into conference. And while Ted is coming, if you'll take your cell phones out, make sure you have them on vibrate or on silent. Good morning, church family. I'd like to call us into conference for the purpose of a budget vote on the proposal of our 2019 budget. Last week, uh, the budget was uh, handed out with a summary uh, attachment, and uh, on Wednesday evening, we had church conference where discussion uh, was taken for the budget. We had a good discussion Wednesday evening, so this morning uh, is the time for the vote. So uh, since this was presented uh, from a committee, no second is needed. Our discussion has already taken place, so at this time, I'll call for the question. All in favor of accepting the 2019 budget that was proposed by our stewardship committee, please indicate by an uplifted right hand. Thank you. Any opposition? Uh, Same sign. The motion uh, carries. Uh, At this time, uh, this portion of our church conference will be adjourned. We will do a similar uh, vote uh, in the second service and hopefully by the end of the day have our our budget approved. Thank you so much.
of the community of faith that has been created by the love of God. We are the people who have been set free by the word of forgiveness in Jesus Christ. We have come not to parade our own goodness, but to praise the holiness of God. We have come not to boast of what we have done, but to proclaim the redeeming work of Jesus Christ. With all our being, we will praise you. boys and girls, I want to show you some objects this morning, and I'm going to ask you to tell me if you think it's real or fake. So I'm going to show it to you, and then I'm going to say, raise your hand if you think it's real, raise your hand if you think it's fake. You ready? Okay, here's our first one, a frog. Raise your hand if you think it's real. Raise your hand if you think it's fake. Yeah, definitely fake, and I can tell you if it wasn't fake, I wouldn't be holding it. I don't want to hold a frog. Okay, yeah, next. Oh my god, it might it might think that. Okay, what about this? Raise your hand if you think it's real. Raise your hand if you think it's fake. Okay, I'm gonna let somebody touch it and see what you think. Kayla, what do you think? Yeah, this is a fake leaf. It looks pretty real, it's the right color, but this is a fake leaf. Okay, let's look at this one. What about this lemon? 
you think? Raise your hand if you think it's real. Okay, raise your hand if you think it's fake. This one's a little bit trickier. Ellen, what do you think? What do you think? Do you think it's real? What do you think there? You don't think it's real? This is not real. It's a pretty good fake, but it's not a real lemon. All right, last one. Ready? Okay, raise your hand if you think it's real. Raise your hand if you think it's fake. It would be really nice if this was real, but this is fake. It looks really close to the real thing, but it's fake. So as it turns out, all of our objects this morning were fake. Some were harder to tell than others, but when we had to take a closer look to see if it was real or not. You know, sometimes people are like that, including us. We go to church on Sunday, and we worship God, and we pray, and we read our Bible, but if people take a closer look, they might see that as soon as we leave this building on Sunday, we might not do those things anymore. And if we are Christians, if we believe in Jesus, then we need to be the real thing all the time, not just on Sunday, because Jesus was the real thing. He didn't just do what God wanted him to do when he was preaching to the crowds or talking to his disciples. Jesus didn't pretend to be the real thing. He was the real thing all the time. Now, we're not perfect. We're going to make mistakes. But if we believe in Jesus and we love Jesus, then we need to try our best to be like Jesus, not just on Sunday, but every day. Because we want the whole world to know that there is nothing fake about what we believe. We are the real thing. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for these children. Thank you for loving us and taking care of us. We pray that you will help us to be like you every day, not just on Sunday. Amen.
Today is Veterans Day, and in a spirit of worship and thanksgiving, we want to take a moment to give thanks to God for those who have served our country and have served us by serving in the military. So if you are a veteran of any branch of the military, we would ask you to stand and remain standing as I lead us in prayer. God of grace and peace, on this Veterans Day, we give you thanks for those who are standing here and now, and for veterans all over this land who have unselfishly and courageously served our nation in the past and have protected and defended our freedom. We pray for those who have fought, whose spirits and bodies are scarred by war, whose nights are haunted by memories too painful for the light of day. And we pray for all those who are serving our country now in places throughout the world, especially those who are in harm's way. As we pray for them all, we especially remember those who are related to our church family. Drake Curry, Jackson Darling, Derek Hawkins, Zach Jordan, Eric Paris, Vincent and Emily Pozzello, Rob Perkerson, Ben Reed, Stephen Wilson. Lord, shield them from danger and bring them safely home and give their families here peace as they hope and wait and pray for that day. Bless all our veterans for the hardships they have faced and for the sacrifices they have made for a cause greater than themselves. And help us, we pray, to be united with them in our quest for freedom and peace. We pray in the name of the one who is our peace, the Prince of Peace, Jesus the Christ. Father, we 
give thanks to you this morning. We're so blessed and thankful for all that you've entrusted to us. <laughs> our lives, our families, our possessions, and our freedom to freely worship you. We thank you for those who have served protecting us and our freedom to worship you. We give a heartfelt thanks to all veterans. Today, as we give back a portion of what you've entrusted to us, we do so with a joyful heart, knowing that these tithes will be used in your honor and for your glory. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, we pray and say, Amen.
Hasn't the music this morning been so beautiful and on point? Thank you so much. Our scripture passage this morning is from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 9, verses 24 through 28. If you don't have a Bible with you and would like to follow along, this passage begins on page 1055 of our pew Bibles, which are there underneath the pews for you. Um, and to get to Hebrews, you go to the end, to Revelation, then kind of hang a left, and it's not too far that way. Um, so Hebrews chapter 9, verses 24 through 28. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have, to, would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world, but he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Back in the summer of 1971, and I won't ask who was alive and who wasn't, um, the Coca-Cola company rolled out a new television commercial. It began with a blonde woman eyes clear blue, singing the words, I'd like to buy the world a home and furnish it with love. And then a second line about growing apple trees and honey bees and snow white turtle doves. And then the camera pans across rows of young singers smiling with the rising sun, Spanish, Swedish, Nigerian, Nepalese, dressed in a kimono, a Nehru jacket, a turtleneck. And together they sing, I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. Each holds a bottle in his or her right hand, one branded in English, the next in Arabic, another in Thai. I'd like to buy the world a Coke, they sing, and keep it company. And then the camera pulls up to an aerial view of the scene, revealing 200 singers fanned out on a hilltop, a beautiful green hilltop, a youth chorus of the world. Uh, how many remember that commercial? I guess I am dating you. Um, that commercial struck a chord with people. Uh, that commercial about the pursuit of world peace through the consumption of soft drinks. Stands among the ranks of advertisements that transcend their sales pitch and become cultural landmarks. Actually, the commercial was part of a, a larger ad campaign that Coke had rolled out in 1969 that centered around the tagline, It's the Real Thing. Another ad in the campaign featured a jingle that concluded, Coca Cola, it's the real thing, like friendly feelings. It's the real thing. What Coke was tapping into there was this notion of authenticity, of not being a fake and not being a mere imitation. Authenticity as a character trait is highly valued. Uh, by and large, we don't like or we don't trust people or things that come across as phonies or fakes. And not surprisingly, we tend to avoid these types of people and things. We seek out friends and colleagues who are authentic. We buy products that are authentic. We join organizations that are authentic. We want the real thing, not mere phonies or fakes or imitations. So it's important in our image conscious culture for people and products and organizations to get across the message that they are authentic. They're the real thing. The word authentic 
and the concept of authenticity are used quite a bit in Christian circles these days. Christians are sometimes criticized for not actually living up to the standards of behavior set by the Bible or to the standards that we set for other people. So it's not uncommon these days to see churches billing themselves as authentic. It's a way of communicating that we are who we say we are. Our talk, our walk matches our talk. Uh, no doubt it's an important message. We have to let the world know that we are the real thing. But it takes more than just clever marketing. We have to live it out. And we'll get to that. But first, let's take a look at today's scripture reading. The idea of authenticity is at the heart of this passage. And the message is this, Jesus is the real thing. He is our ultimate model of authenticity. But to see what that really means and how it applies to us in the context of this passage, we need to unpack these verses a little bit. The book of Hebrews is actually a letter. Unlike other letters in the New Testament, this one is not signed, so we don't know for sure who wrote it. The letter demonstrates such a knowledge of the Old Testament that it appears to be a letter from a teacher or a scholar to a group of Christians, scholars think probably in Rome. The writer of the letter was their teacher and at the moment of writing was separated from them and was afraid that they might be drifting away from the faith. So he wrote this letter to them. He's talking to them and encouraging them to stay true to the faith. And the writer's overarching message throughout the letter has to do with being reconciled to God having access to God. Some people see faith as the thing that gives us a standard for living and a power to achieve that standard. Others see faith as the thing that gives us the greatest inner satisfaction in life. The writer of this letter to the Hebrews sees faith as the thing that gives us access to God and brings us reconciliation with God. Faith in Jesus removes the barrier of sin that separates us from God. Faith in Jesus opens the door to the heavenly realm and reconciles us to God. That's the main point of this letter. It's summed up in this great passage from chapter 10 of Hebrews. It says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let's hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful that's the message of Hebrews summed up hold fast to your faith because he who promised is faithful that he will take us to God himself we can tell from the letter to the Hebrews that the writer had a Greek background ever since the time of Plato the Greeks had been fascinated with the notion that there is this eternal world where true reality exists. There is a world where truth exists. But this temporal world that we live in is just an imitation of that real thing. A mere shadow of that real thing. And the great goal of life, according to this way of looking at it, is to move from the shadows to the truth, from imitations to the real thing. 
And the message of Hebrews is Jesus gives us access to the real thing, to the eternal kingdom of God. But we can also tell from the letter that the writer had a Jewish background. God had established a special covenant relationship with the nation of Israel. God offered access to himself, to Israel, but only if Israel kept the law. To break the law was sin, and sin put up a barrier between the people and God. So there had to be a way in this system to break down that barrier between the people and God. And here comes in this concept of atonement. We hear that word in church, atonement. And atonement is basically doing something to make things right. Doing something to break down this barrier of sin. The barrier that separates people from God. In God's covenant with Israel, there was a sacrificial system in place. In order to remove the barrier of sin, preventing access to God, the priest would offer a sacrifice, an atonement for sin. Doing something to break that barrier to make things right. But inevitably, the sacrifice was not sufficient to keep the access open. People would continue to sin, and the barrier would come up again. And so the sacrificial system went on and on, over and over. It was a losing battle to remove and break down this barrier between people and God. And what the people really needed and what we all really need is a perfect priest and a perfect sacrifice. Someone who could bring a sacrifice to God once and for all that would open the way to God. We don't need a second rate imitation. We don't need a, a shadow of a sacrifice. We need the real thing. And the message of Hebrews is this, that Jesus is that perfect priest and perfect sacrifice. He has given himself as the perfect sacrifice that gives us access to God and reconciles us to God once and for all. Jesus is the real thing. And the perfect sacrifice of Jesus is the sacrifice of himself. A sacrifice so perfect that it never has to be repeated. Unlike the old sacrificial system, this doesn't have to be done over and over. Listen again to these verses from our passage. Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world, but he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. And so to the Jews, the writer of Hebrew is, Hebrews is saying, all your lives, you've been looking for the perfect priest who can bring the perfect sacrifice and give you access to God. And you have him in Jesus, in Jesus alone. And to the Greeks, the writer is saying, you're looking for the way from the shadows to reality, from the imitations to the real thing, and you'll find it in Jesus. Jesus alone. And to us, the writer of Hebrews is still saying, you want to be right with God? You want the real thing? You want authenticity? You'll find it in Jesus and Jesus alone. So that's what we might call the vertical lesson from this passage and from the letter to the Hebrews in general. If we want to be right with God, 
If we want access to God, if we want to be reconciled with God, we can find it through faith in Jesus, in Jesus alone. But what about what we might call the horizontal lesson? What does this passage and what does the message of Hebrews teach us about how we treat one another? How we relate to the people around us? Is there a lesson to be learned in this regard? Well, as you might have guessed, I think there is. And here we get back to this notion of authenticity. People want the real thing. We want authenticity in our relationships. We tend to avoid connecting with people who are phony. We tend to avoid buying products that are fake. And we tend to avoid intertwining our lives with organizations, including churches, maybe especially churches, that are phony or fake or inauthentic. When it comes to our relationships, especially our relationship with our community of faith, we want the real thing. And so what we can learn from this passage and from the letter to the Hebrews, what can we learn about being the real thing? We are far removed from the old sacrificial system where the high priest would offer a sacrifice to atone for the sins of the people. But how often do we still sacrifice one another? How often do we look for someone to blame for something? Jesus was the only perfect, sinless person who ever lived on this earth. And yet, he was willing to sacrifice himself for our sins. Are we willing to make that same kind of sacrifice for each other? Even when we are blameless, are we willing to give up being right and forgive another person? Are we willing to let another person off the hook in the name of love? That's what the real thing looks like. If Jesus truly is our perfect priest, and if he has truly offered the perfect sacrifice, then we don't have to worry about squaring up every account with each other. Jesus has already taken care of it. As we deal with one another and live with one another, we are going to offend one another. We are all sinners, and that's just the way it is. But we don't have to sacrifice one another. We don't have to make a scapegoat out of anybody because Jesus has already made the perfect sacrifice. That system is over. The church is not a place where people have to earn forgiveness. If we want to be authentic, if we want to be the real thing, then we freely forgive and we freely love without strings attached. That's the example of Jesus. That's the real thing. And that's the essence of the greater way. And so the invitation today is this. Only Jesus can atone for our sins. Only by faith in him can we be reconciled to God. Have you put your faith in him? Have you been reconciled to God? If not, do it today. I invite you to come. And maybe you have put your faith in Jesus to make things right with God, but you are still making sacrifices out of people in your life. Give it up today. Give it over to Jesus. Embrace his forgiveness and then shower it on the people around you. I invite you to come. 
And maybe you sense that God is calling you to join our family of faith here at Earl Street as we try to be the real thing together. We're all on this journey, and we would love for you to join us. Whatever your situation is, our pastor, Stephen, will be here at the front to receive you as we sing. Oh. 